to be a member. This is for a Berea family. So don't think, well, I'm not a member, so I can't do it. This is for anybody who wants to be part of, of this um, website. Uh, as far as security, I know some of you have said, oh, this is online, I don't want to do that. Um, we, we, know, we think that it is very secure. Again, let me just say, you, no one can get in unless we have put your email address in it. So that's what it is. Raise your hand if you have access already. Ah, look at there. So we got a lot of people. When you go to the site, it just asks you to make a password, but we have to put you in before you can get in. Okay, so if you have any questions, please let Nora or I know. And if you'd like a, a form, Nora, you can raise your hand, she'll give you one now. And uh, I'll be outside after the worship service if you want to have your picture taken. Thanks. Thank you. And the great part about that is the fact that it can be updated all year. We don't have to have a paper directory. Now, it can be printed off, and that's one of those things that um, if, you, if you don't have access to a computer or the Internet or don't, have, don't want to put it as an app on your phone, um, we can print it off for you in the church office. You just have to let us know that. Uh, but we're definitely trying to get as many families in there as we can. It's, it's been a great tool so far uh, just in getting, keeping up with folks. Um, so definitely, if you're interested, make sure you meet up with those ladies uh, after church today. Yeah, we want to get it printed this summer, so give us another couple weeks, everybody getting all their information in, that'll be great. All right, so now we can uh, jump into our official announcements, I guess. That was the pregame, and now we're jumping into the announcements. Uh, it is exciting to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen? amen. A great chance just to come together and worship. Uh, I want to thank everybody who came out this past Sunday uh, to spend some time with us in the Family Life Center, working to package over 10,000, 11,000 meals that we had. It was cool to find out that the meals that we put together last year went to Swaziland, I think is what he said. Uh, and then we'll be able to find out where the ones, eventually we'll be able to find out where these are going uh, again in the next couple of weeks and months. Uh, but it was a great chance to come together and just and worship and serve. And honestly, it, it, if, if he hadn't talked as much as he did, we'd have been done in like an hour and 20 minutes. I mean, it, it took us two hours and 20 minutes, but it, he talked for like an hour, which was amazing. Uh, but, and I thought I talked a lot. So it was awesome to, to get together. <laughs> I didn't do that. We had a great time last night uh, going to the ball game down there at the Diamond. I want to thank everybody who came out and did that. Uh, again, what's that? It, it's okay. It's a, they don't generally win, so we're in good shape. It was, it, it was just fun to go there and spend some time together. Any other announcements before we jump into things today? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and for your goodness. We thank you for your love and mercy. God, how you work in ways we can't even begin to understand. We ask now, Lord, that your presence would fill this place, that you would guide us and that you would direct us, Lord, that all that we do during this time would be pleasing to you. We love you, Lord, and it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is from Proverbs 31, verses 30 and 31. It says, Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And honor for her all that her hands have done, and let her works bring praise to the gate. Thank you, Matt. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. I see dad's frowning. Okay, moms are smiling though, that's okay. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord today and we're just glad you're here. Thank you for coming. If you're a guest with us today, you might notice there's a little blue card in the rack in front of you there in the pew. If you would fill that out for us and place that and make that your offering today if you would, just so we'd have a record of your visit. And here at Berea, we like to greet each other. We're really good at it. <laughs> We try to keep it to two minutes, so if you would, that'd be great, because we're still going to recognize moms this morning. Uh, let's all stand together and greet those around us and say, good morning, God loves you, and so do I. Let's meet each other. Good morning, God loves you, and so do I. Can I move the stand? Hmm? Can I move the stand? Yeah, we don't need it. I've used that, where it counts down and then it, whoop, 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 it goes go. crazy. I don't know, she quit putting it in the slides. I wonder if, I don't know. Nice. All right, let's start finding our way back to our seats, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Morning, man. Please be seated. Okay, so we're going to recognize our, all of our mothers, and the hanging plants are going to be for those. We're going to recognize the oldest mom, the youngest mom, and the mom who has the most children here today. And we bought extra in case there's a tie. And if we don't have a tie, then the remaining baskets will go to the nursing home. And we also have a flower for every mom here today. So moms, we want you to know you are loved and appreciated. And uh, blessed are you. So I would like to see if we could get some boys and girls to come and help me hand out flowers. Are there boys and girls here that could be my helpers? Oh, thank you. Oh, what good job. 
Thank you. Oh, good helpers. So, here's the awkward part. <clears throat> so let's see, do we have any moms here that would be age 90 and above? Do we have a 90? One, two, do we have two? A mom that is, no? Yes or no? No? All right, we have a winner. <laughs> Lena, yay! God bless you. All right. Let's see if we can find the youngest mom. Moms that are under age 30, could you raise your hand? I don't want to be under 30. Not. You hear my wife? She's a wannabe. Okay. Do I have moms that are under age 30? Anybody? Any mom? Under? Okay. Kelly? Kelly? It is Kelly. All right. Nice. Let's see which mom has the most children in worship with her today. This will be a fun one. All right, raise your hand if you have three children here today. One, two, three, four. Anybody have four children with you here today? Looking for hands. Anybody with four children here today? All right, so it looks like Raise your hand again if you have three children. I want to see if we have enough baskets. One, two, three. We have four. All right. Um, I was told if we needed to get another hanging basket, we will ha we'll get it first thing in the morning. Nora, can we give you yours maybe? Wednesday? And now, boys and girls, Moms, if you will raise your hand, and all the boys and girls are going to, we're just going to hand out all the moms. Hey, and by the way, ladies, if you're here and you still like flowers, if we have some extras, we want to make sure everybody gets, all the ladies get one. That would be a lot of fun. There, there, there was a lady in the back that had three children. Over there in the back, yeah, over there in the back. She, okay. Hope you like white roses, ladies. What do we have? Three children? Yes. How about those boys and girls? Good helping. Thank you. <laughs> the we need the hanging basket back here. Oh, we need another flower. Do we have one more flower? Over here. Thank you. Need two more? Excellent. And, oh, we need one more over here, too.
We had our fingers crossed that we had enough. Whew. Thank you. Moms, we love you. Thank you for all you do. Let's hear it for moms. Shout to the Lord is a song. Let's all rise to our feet. Let's lift our voices in worship. today. I pray a special blessing on all the mothers here today. Bless them, Lord, as they serve you through all the work that they do for you and for their families and otherwise. Lord, I pray a special blessing on this church. It's exciting to see what God is doing in this place. And Lord, we want more. We want, we're hungry for God. We want to feel you and experience you. We want to see your handiwork right here in this place. So right on this little corner, right here in Rockville, Hylas, Virginia, Lord, could revival start here? I pray it, it could be, and it will be. Today, Lord, whatever is on our hearts, whatever baggage we're carrying, emotionally and spiritually, Lord, let us turn it over to you this day. Help us, Lord, to leave here, leave here cleansed and refreshed and filled with you. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our offertory hymn this morning is God Give Us Christian Homes. We'll be singing the first, third, and fourth stanzas. If you're a hymnal person, it's number 504. Let's stand on the last stanza, please. Thank you. 
God give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for the beauty of this past week. We thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to be here to celebrate in your house today, to honor mothers today, dear Lord, and more importantly, dear Lord, that, uh, to honor you in praise and worship. And dear Lord, as we take this time to give back to you, that these offering and tithes be used to further your kingdom, and so others may know your love, grace, and mercy. Amen. Amen. Please be
What a joy. Wow. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim with us the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. He is worthy to be praised.
We serve an awesome God, amen? amen. I hope that's a truth and a reality that uh, you've been able to experience this week, that you've been excited about all that God is doing and seeing him moving in your life, because he does. He has a plan and a purpose for each of us, and a desire to see us draw closer to him each and every day. Now, over the past several weeks and months, we've been focusing on this idea of being bold in our relationship with Jesus and trying to understand what exactly that looks like to be bold, to have confidence, to trust in the plan and purpose that he has, and then to step out and go. And we're emphasizing this idea of going out right now to share. Now, last week, anybody remember what we talked about last week? Anybody remember what story we were looking at last week? It's that reminder. Anybody remember? Those of you who are in Walter's class, I know he gave you a reminder for Sunday school. What, what was it? What were we talking about? We're talking about dreaming big, right? It's, it's this idea of it's okay to, to have a God-given vision, a God-given dream, and for him to guide us and direct us in that. If we can look at a situation, and we'll talk about it, what story were we looking at there? Anybody remember? All right, push is one part of it. Anybody know what push means? It gets quiet. It's on the sign outside. I was like, I have no idea. Pray until something happens. Each day you need to push. You've got to pray until something happens. And we're talking about the idea of pushing through each and every circumstance that you find yourself in right now. The devil wants to fight you in every area of your life. He wants to manipulate, he wants to lie, he wants to cheat, he wants to steal, and he will do it in every way that he possibly can to pull us away from the purpose that God has set before us. Now, in our Bible studies on Wednesday night, we've been focusing on the names of God. Now, we, we ask ourselves this question every week. Why is a name important? So help me out. Why is a name important? It defines you, right? It defines who you are. Every time you say a name, you immediately have a reaction, right? Like when you, when you see Devin Henson, immediately you have a reaction and a response, right? And, say, and everybody, everybody laughs. Nobody's doing it out loud right now. <laughs> when you think John Baldwin, you're like, immediately you have a response. You're like, that's amazing. And it's just like all oh, right there, right? <laughs> Sam Stone, and you just shake your head. You're like, I don't even know where to go with that one. <laughs> But when you have a name, when you hear a name, it's automatically an association with somebody. You can relate it. You have aspects of their life, characteristics of who they are that immediately come out. And so when we think about the names of God, they bring out the characteristics that we see. And we talk about them, the different times that they were used in Scripture. We even focused on our, our youth Bible study that we have at All Shucks on Thursday mornings. We talked about the fact that the different names of God were used over 7,000 times throughout Scripture. And that each time when, when you're talking about copying and printing these manuscripts, because back in the day they weren't copied on copy paper, they were handwritten. Each time that they used the name of God, they would get out, the monks who were copying these or the priests who were doing it, they would get out an extra, a new, brand new jar of ink. They would get out a new quill pen and they would write it out. And then they would take a bath as if to cleanse themselves and get out a new pen and a new ink. Every time they did that, over 7,000 times they would do that because they recognized the holiness and the reverence that comes with the name of God because they were understanding who he is. And a name always draws us into the depth of a relationship with somebody. Everybody's got a nickname. Everybody has a nickname. Whether you want to share it with anybody, you don't have to do that right now. But everybody has a nickname, and you think about the moments at which you got those nicknames. You think about all of those times and, and what was going on in those circumstances and those situations. This past week, the name that we were looking at with God was El Shaddai. And it's this idea of, what does it mean? It means God Almighty, or translated Almighty God. And you think about the power and the majesty that comes with Almighty God. Now just pause for a moment and think about this. Everything that you go through, the fact that you are here this morning, like we've talked about last week, is a miracle. Everything that is going on right now is a miracle. And if we stop and pause for just a moment, we'll embrace it. We'll think about God Almighty. We'll thank Almighty God for all that he does in our lives on a daily basis. And yet we hesitate. And yet we pause. And yet we oftentimes don't give thanks where thanks is due. Think about that when it comes to our moms. How many of us take our moms for granted? Whether they're here with us now or have passed on to go be with the Lord, how many of us take that relationship for granted? I was looking at Genesis chapter 17. This is the, the first time that we see the word El Shaddai, and we'll get into it in Joshua in just a second. But Genesis chapter 17 is the first time we see something important happening here. 
When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully, faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. When we look at this passage right here in Genesis, the idea of El Shaddai, God Almighty, is, is being rooted back to, is being reminded of a promise that God had made Abram back in Genesis chapter 12. He had told Abram, he said, look, I am going to bless you and all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. But I am God Almighty. In Genesis chapter 15, he's promised that he will have a child. In Genesis 16, we see that he doubts that and attempts to create his own way of fulfilling God's promise in his life. And in Genesis 17, God said, I am God Almighty. Trust my plan for you. I'm telling you that for a reason. God has you here for a purpose this morning. It's not by accident. It's not by chance. It's not by coincidence. He has you sitting right here this morning for a specific reason. Let's embrace it. Let's get excited about that. Let's trust that and let's pay attention to what he wants to show us. He is God Almighty. He is Almighty God. His arm is long enough to reach out and guide us, to direct us, to lead us. So we're looking at this passage today in Genesis chapter 2. And it was funny, as I was going through this, I found an interesting tribute that a woman wrote for her mother, and I wanted to share it with you real quick. When the good Lord was creating mothers, he was well into his sixth day of overtime when an angel appeared and said, you're doing an awful lot of fiddling around on this one. The Lord said, have you read the specs on this model? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. Have 180 movable parts, run on black coffee and leftovers, have a lap that disappears when she stands up, a kiss that can cure anything from a broken leg to a broken heart, and six pairs of hands. The angel shook his head slowly and said, six pairs of hands? No way. It's not the hands that are causing me the problem, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers must have. That's on the standard model, the angel asked. The Lord nodded, one pair to see through closed doors when she asks, what are you kids doing in there? When she already knows. <laughs> Another pair in the back of her head to see what her children are doing when they don't think she's watching. And of course, the ones here on the front that can look a child in the eyes when he goofs up and say, I love you anyway, without even saying a word. I can't quit now. I already have one who heals herself when she gets sick, can feed a family of six on a pound of hamburger, and can somehow get a nine-year-old boy to actually take a bath. <laughs> the angel circled the project very slowly. It's soft, he sighed. But tough, said the Lord. You can't imagine what this mother can endure. Can it think? Not only can it think, it can reason, compromise, and dream, said the creator. Finally, the angel bent over and ran his finger across her cheek. There's a leak, he shouted. I told you you were trying to put too much into this model. It's not a leak, said the Lord. It's a tear. What's it for? It's for joy and sadness, pain and pride, hope and grace, said the Lord. The angel cried out, you are a genius. When we think of the moms in our life, when we think of the women who God has blessed us with, who we are around right now, our God knows what he's doing. Our God is a God of great power and great strength. We thank God today for mothers. We thank God today for the relationships that we have. Somebody give me an amen like you're excited about that, right? Like you're truly thankful for that as we work through the tears of remembering what our mom has done for us. There's not a mother here today who I don't think hasn't wept over the inadequacies that she has ha had in her life, but desires to draw closer to God. And that's what makes you special. Today we thank you. Today we honor you. You'll never know the far-reaching impact your commitment and your love and your example have made upon the lives of the people who you not only know, but those who you just simply encounter on a daily basis. The same can be said of the person we're talking about here today in Joshua chapter 2. If we're looking at this passage and we're talking about somebody, if you want to write a story about somebody scandalous in Scripture, Rahab is one of the people you would talk about. She's one of the ones you would pay attention to, a pagan with sin, a sin-ravaged past, a prostitute who would 
go on to become such a hero that we not only see her printed in this passage, but we also see her mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, when we're reminded of those who had great faith. So as we consider her life, I want each of us to think about our own. Maybe you've dealt with or you are dealing with mistakes in your life right now. Maybe you too have wondered if you could ever become the person that God has created you to be. Rahab's going to show us right here that by God's grace, no matter what you've done, regardless of the circumstances or the decisions that you've made, you too can experience a life that will have an impact not just in your current generation, but in the generations to follow. So let us pay attention here to Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what, you, what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now seeking your guidance and your direction. We seek your wisdom as we focus on your truth. Help us, Lord, to set aside any distractions that might consume us, anything that might pull us away from you. God, and let us just spend these few brief moments focusing on you and you alone. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. From this passage right here, we can learn a lot about the condition of Rahab. We can see who she is. First off, what's her condition? Her condition is hopelessness. We see the emotional, the physical, the spiritual decay that's gone on there. Verse 1 tells us, if we get there in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 tells us that she was a prostitute. It doesn't hide that. It doesn't try to go around that. It simply says that they, they go over there and render a prostitute, go into the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stay there. One, she's a prostitute. Verse 15, we see that she's living in the wall of Jericho. Now, the wall of Jericho, you got to imagine here. you got to remember, we've talked about this. You have two walls that surround Jer Jericho, and you have a space in between that's anywhere from 10 to 15 feet in between those two walls. And you basically have shanty houses that are built up in there. You have the poor. You have the destitute, those who are homeless. They put together anything they possibly can, and they live in between the two walls on the outside of Jericho. What that means is basically they are a human shield for anybody who attacks the city. They're going to be the first ones that get hit. They're going to be the first ones that are bombarded. And she's poor. She's destitute. And here she lives in the midst of the wall. She's a prostitute. She lives in the wall. Physically and emotionally, everything is rough right now in Rahab's life. Sometimes, though, think about this. We rush to judgment over people and unfair judgment of people. Because when you think about that with Rahab, you're thinking, there's no way God can use this person right here. And yet we know God well enough, El Shaddai, Almighty God, he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whoever he wants. And that means you too. 
There's no excuse and there's no way for you to get out of the fact that God wants to use you right now. But it's so, we so often are quick to judge. I was reading this story. thought it was pretty good. A prosperous young Wall Street broker fell in love with a beautiful young woman and decided before he, before he was going to propose to her, he wanted to marry her, but he wanted to be cautious. And before he decided he was going to propose, he had a private investigator to go around and follow her. Gentlemen, I wouldn't ever recommend this, this action at all. But he was smart. He said, look, this is what, it, this is what I want you to do. He said, he, he, he told his friend, he had his friend get it set up. And the agency, he said, I don't want anybody to know it's me. One, because if she finds out, well, that's not a good thing at all for anybody. And two, I don't want the guy, who, the private investigator, to come back and give me a biased report. I want an honest, straightforward report. And so he waited for a couple of weeks. Two weeks go by, nothing. Three weeks go by, four weeks go by. Finally, he gets a report back from his friend. The private investigator had come, given it to his friend. He brings it to him. And this is what the report said. The young lady in question has an unblemished past and a spotless reputation. Her friends are of the highest moral character, and she didn't even have a traffic ticket on her record. Now, when he's hearing that, you can imagine, oh, he's feeling good about this. He already knows what kind of ring he's going to buy her. He's getting ready. He said, now, right now, I'm going to go get this. He said, but... There's always a but when it comes to situations like this. But the only negative thing that this private investigator could find about this woman right here is that she's often seen around town in the company of a young broker of questionable reputation. <laughs> Some of y'all get that here in a little bit. Don't worry about it. You'll think about it. So often we, we look and we make judgments that aren't necessarily accurate or true. We don't pay attention to that. We don't give people a chance. And it's, let's be honest, the moment you see somebody, we make a judgment about them. Whether it's what they're wearing, how tall they are, how short they are. Everybody wants to laugh when they have to look at me. Like, come on, man. But in this situation right here, the Bible doesn't hesitate. The Bible doesn't hold back in who this woman is. Prostitute living in the wall. Rahab, in many ways, had never known what it was to have a life, to have anything positive moving in her life. Her poverty... And her sin had taken its toll, eking out a meager living by sacrificing everything that she had for people who walked by. But God loved her. Do you hear me? God loved her. Just like he loves you right now. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. God loves you. He had a plan for this woman who was victimized by sin, just like he has a plan for you. Each of us is victimized by sin. He sent his spies to her house, not simply to secure military information. Our God doesn't do anything by coincidence, by chance, or by accidents. He did this to impact her life and her family's life and those who would come after her in generations. She was lost. Her past made her future prospects seem hopeless. And yet we know with God there is always hope. What's her condition? She's hopeless. Apart from God, she is absolutely hopeless. We ask ourselves that question. The world we live in today, let's be honest, apart from Jesus, is hopeless. You are encountering people in your life right now who need Jesus because they live in a world that is hopeless. I had a friend of mine this past week. I grew up two houses away from him. We went to high school together. Spent a lot of time playing ball together and got a phone call and a text message this week that because of the hopelessness in his life, he took his own. That is the world that we live in. There's hopelessness everywhere, and we have Jesus. We have Jesus. What are we doing with the message of Jesus that we have, the gift of hope that we have? What are we doing with that? Are we sharing that? Are we embracing those around us, or do we quickly judge people? Because when we quickly judge people and decide I'm not sharing with them, we've ushered them right into hell. But we live in a world of hopelessness. So let's look at the second part of this. What else can we learn about Rahab? Why did she surrender? We know that she surrenders. We know that she gives in. We know that she's actually converted. When we look at this, there are three important things that result or the reason that she is willing to surrender completely. The first is this. Verse 9 reveals that she was afraid. 
She had heard that Israel was moving toward Jericho. She had heard how God had enabled Israel to defeat other kings and lands. She had heard that God was with them and that he had pur purposed to destroy the walled fortress of Jericho. Look at this. And she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. I know what's coming. I'm afraid. I'm terrified. I, I can see the power and the strength of your God. I know that he is the God in heaven, the only God. I know that, and I'm afraid. I'll be honest, first time when I came to know the Lord, I was 12 years old, and I did it partly out of fear. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't start going to church until I was 12. It was actually kind of funny. It was a Mother's Day when I was 12 years old, first time I went to church on a consistent basis. My mom, I'll never forget this story. My mom got my dad up. And my dad came and get me, and like, what are we doing? And like, we're going to church. And I'm like, Mom, Dad, you got to talk to her. She's lost her mind. I'm not going to church this morning. Because church was, at the time, as a 12-year-old, boring. I wasn't excited about it. There wasn't any passion about Jesus at the time. You can tell there's a little bit of passion about Jesus now. But I remember 12 years old, wanting to go, not wanting to go. My mom and dad, my dad was, was 42 at the time. My mom was 39. I remember that. And I'm like, why are we going to church? We go to church at Christmas, and we go to church at Easter. We have done both of those. <laughs> but my mom decided it's Mother's Day. We're going to church. So dad, being dad, was like, well, just do what your mother says. It'll just be this week. So the next week, dad's like, get up. Your mom wants to go to church. I'm like, dad, you lied to me. <laughs> you told me it was just last week, I'm not going to church as a 12-year-old. Don't you love that when you look at your dad and say, I'm not going to do something? That went over real well. He's like, I'm giving you two minutes. Get up and get outside. Yes, sir, I'm up, I'm out. So we went to church, and he said, maybe this will be it. Week three comes along, I'm thinking, we're good. You know, I mean, church was at 11. We didn't go to Sunday school at the time. We're like, all right, we're good. It hits like 10, 15, 10, 10, 10. You're like, oh, we're not going to church this week. We've made it. And then dad rolls up in there, quick, we're late, get together, we got to go to church. Three weeks in a row, and I'm like, somebody's got to talk to her, she has lost her mind. <laughs> week after week after week after week, we go. And then one Sunday, I watched my parents walk up front. They had surrendered their life to Jesus, they're 39 and 42, which is very rare, and had surrendered their life to Jesus. And I'm like, well, what is that all about now? And so I'm asking and I'm talking, and my mom and my dad every night are talking to me about Jesus and sharing, just sharing the truth of Jesus. Because I knew about Jesus. I knew about him. I just didn't know him. I didn't have that depth of relationship. I didn't understand all of it. And I'll never forget it. When I started grasping, I started, I started this, going through this idea of surrendering to Christ. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And talking about just if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. If you cry out to God, confess, repent, turn everything over, you're, you're going to be saved. If you recognize that you need Jesus, he's faithful to save. And I just remember, I didn't understand all of it, but I knew that I wanted it. But 12 years old, I, I, we had finished up our baseball season. And we were all going to King's Dominion. It was amazing. That was the great. You're coming from Farmville to go to King's Dominion. That is the greatest thing in the world. And so I just remember going to King's Dominion, and everybody was all hyped up about riding the Rebel Yell because that was like the only thing that was real good there. Now it's like Racer 76, whatever that thing is. And I just remember thinking, man, this is going to be so much fun. And then as I laid my head down to go to sleep one night, I'm like, what happens if the thing flies off the tracks? I'm going to die, and I'm going to go to hell. And I sat and I talked to my mom and my dad about that, and I didn't understand it. And they began to explain it. They went through all those verses again, the, the, the scripture in Romans, and I realized I wanted to do this. I realized I wanted to commit. I realized I wanted to surrender, but I was a little bit afraid if I didn't, I was going to go to hell, and I was right. If I don't have a relationship with Jesus, I am going to go to hell. And too often we miss that. We miss talking about that in church because that makes people feel uncomfortable. And it's a, it's a lie we've got to avoid. Hell is a real place. And if we don't have a relationship with him, if we don't remember that God is holy and God hates sin, if we don't remember that I am a sinner, lost without Jesus, we will go there. And so fear guided me. You see this situation with her. Fear guided her. She saw what was coming. She knew there was no hope of her succeeding in any part of this. They were condemned because of what was coming. Genuine fear. It's not a bad place to start when it comes to the Lord. Actually, it's a place of wisdom when we begin to understand and respect. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When you begin to pay attention to that, 
Could it be that one of the reasons more people aren't being converted, aren't being led to Jesus today is because there's no fear of God in them? There's no fear of God. There's no fear of anything in people today. And so we ask ourselves, why is it that there's no fear of God? Why is there no fear, no healthy fear today? And I'm not talking about a fear that paralyzes you and causes you to do nothing. I'm talking about a fear or respect and understanding and the holiness of who God is. But why is it that we don't have that today? Who's to blame for this lack of a healthy fear? Well, number one, it's preachers. Preachers are the problem when it comes to this because we've watered down the gospel. Too many times we see people, whether it's on TV or walking into church, we talk about half of the truth of the gospel. We want people to feel good inside. We want them to walk away feeling all fluffy and happy and everything is fantastic. And so we preach about the heaven side of things and we ignore the fact that we are a lost people in need of redemption and salvation. And so we've watered it all down and that's on us. And then churches, what have we done? Let's entertain everybody. Let's entertain everybody. Let's entertain everybody. I'm all for coming together, worshiping, having a fantastic time. Because when you are worshiping Jesus, there's nothing greater in the world. Some of y'all just woke up. There you go. We're going to get together and worship Jesus right now. But there's nothing greater than that. But churches want to entertain too much. We want to please you. We want you to feel bad. I, get, I, I laugh when we send out surveys to people who are lost. Why are we asking them what they want in a worship service? Why are you asking lost people what they want in a worship service? Why don't we look into God's word about what he wants in a worship service? He wants people who are willing to serve and love and surrender completely to him. That's where differences happen. That's where change happens. And when that happens genuinely in us, the world outside sees it, they want it, and then they desire to follow God his way and his way alone. We have to trust. We have to realize it begins with preachers. It begins with the church. And you know what? In time, it is simply a reality. Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about what's going to happen as time passes, as things go on in the end. Let me read this for you. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many will make a choice to turn away from the faith and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Because of the wickedness, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. We can't be surprised about what's happening in the world. It just means we're a day closer to Jesus returning. But we have a mission. We have a plan. There is a fear. There is a healthy fear that needs to be taught, that needs to be preached, that needs to be understood. How will they hear if we don't tell them? How will they know if we're not there to share? But not only did she have a fear that moved her, she had a pretty clear understanding about what was going on. Verses 10 and 11. She acknowledges how God has blessed Israel, empowered them to defeat their enemies, shielded them from harm, and met every single need. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. The Lord your God, the Lord my God is the Lord, is the only Lord. And he is in charge of it all. She saw that. She recognized the truth and she believed it because she saw the actions of his people. She heard the stories and now she sees it in, in the lives of those she encounters. What do people see when they encounter us? Do they see a genuine person who has a genuine faith, who has a genuine passion and desire for Jesus? Or do they see those of us who just simply roll up in here on Sunday morning, put a smile on our face, pick up the Bible to act like we've read it throughout the course of the week and then put it down the moment we get home? People want something genuine. They want something real and we can recognize it. Can you tell when somebody's being fake with you? Some of y'all are lying in church right now. We can tell when somebody's being fake with us, four of y'all being honest. We can tell, and why is it that the church, we try to fake it, like people aren't going to pick up on it. When you're not genuine, you don't care about people, they know it. When you're trying to use them, they see it. But with Jesus, oh, I had a pastor friend this past week say something that's kind of, that bothered me until I called him out on it. He said this, 
He said, you got to be weary of relationships where you don't get anything out of it. I was like, hmm, that does not sound biblical at all. He said, you got to be weary of those because they'll take and they'll take and they'll take and there's no gain for you. It's this cost-reward impact relationship. I was like, we are not in a business. And so let me tell you something right here. I shot him a message and then we had a conversation. I said, let's look that, let's compare that theology with that of Jesus. What if Jesus had said, I'm not going down there unless I can get something out of them right there. Jesus wouldn't have showed up. Gee, we have nothing to offer him. We have nothing to give him. That's of, that's of the value of the debt that he paid on the cross for us, and yet he chose to out of a love for each of us. He chose to, he chose to, he chose to. That's the depth of his love. You have relationships with people because people need relationships and they need Jesus. You love on people regardless of what you can get out of them. You're not doing anything to get anything out of them. You're doing this to share Christ with them. So we see, all right, what is it? What is it? Number three, what did she do once she recognized this truth? She professed it. She professed it. We see in chapter 6, if we continue on, her entire family is saved. Her entire family is saved. And then God drastically changes her life. You know that Rahab eventually has a son, and you may have heard of him. His name is Boaz. Anybody ever heard of Boaz? Boaz was married to who? Ruth. Ruth. We eventually find out that Rahab becomes the great-grandmother of David, who is of the line of who? Jesus. You see the impact right here? You make a quick judgment about a person. You see her life. She's living in a wall, and she's a prostitute, and thinks she's not worth anything. And God looked at her and says, I am going to have the Savior come through her. He has a specific plan and a purpose for you right now that will impact generations behind you. Trust him. Follow him. One of the things that El Shaddai teaches us as we've looked at this scripture, as we've talked about it in God's word, God Almighty, Almighty God, one of the things that it, practical application as we close out today, practical application, how does that fit into my life? How does that fit? It requires radical obedience. You obey even when it doesn't make sense. You trust even when it doesn't make sense. Joshua was told to walk around a city six days, one time each day. I, I, I still think it's amazing because he got everybody to be quiet during that travel. You're not allowed to talk, not one whisper. And nobody said a word. You know why? There's a healthy fear there. There's a consequence, there's a trust, there's a love of God there. Did it make sense for him to do that? Not at all. And yet he did. And we know what happened. It didn't make sense to look at all of these scripture passages, to, to look at the stories and try to see why, why, why did they do all of these things. The reason they did all of these things was out of a radical obedience to the God who called them to do it. He is calling you to be obedient to him today. Everything stems from obedience. Will I love my neighbor? Yes. Why? Because I'm, I, I, it's obedient. God has called me to. Will I love my spouse? Yes. Why? Because God has called me to. Will I tell others about Jesus? Yes. Why? Because God has called me to. It's obedience. We are called to radically obey. Today, what will you do? Will you stand up and proclaim Jesus or will we shy away? Will we hide? If Jesus were to walk into this room right now and say, who is on my side? Would you stand up and say, I am. Let's go to Short Pump and tell people about Jesus. Let's go to Short Pump and talk about you to those around. How many of us would follow? It's a legitimate question because he's called each of us to share the truth with somebody. Who is your somebody? In reality, though, as with every week, it comes down to a choice. You and I are as close to Jesus today as we want to be. The choice is entirely up to us. How close do you want to be? Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for the truth and the grace and the goodness that you offer to us, Father. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. I pray, Father, if there's somebody here today who doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray they will not leave this place without making a decision to follow you completely. 
God, if there's somebody here today who's, who's been away for a little while and they just want to, they need to come back. They recognize that. Father, I, help they, I hope they know. Lord, help them to know that you haven't gone anywhere. You are right where you have always been with them. Father, we thank you for the truth of your message. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the hope that you give us, the salvation that is for all of us, and your word that guides us and directs us. Help us, Father, to be obedient. Help us, Father, to trust and obey today. We love you, and it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. The words are on the screen. The hymn is 282. God, take the truth of his love, his grace, and his goodness, and share it with somebody today. It will impact their life. It will impact your life for all of eternity. This morning, it's exciting. We have Brandy and Jeremy coming up here. They have been active and involved with what God has been doing here at Berea, and they're excited. They want to come and join membership here with the church. So can I get somebody to give us a motion that we accept them? A motion. Somebody second it? Second. All in favor say amen. 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 So now I told them they have a 10-minute speech. They're, they're forced to give right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm going to ask them to stay right here. <laughs> Congratulations, man. It is exciting to see all that God is doing here. I'm going to ask them to stay right here. I'm going to get you guys to come up and give them a hug, tell them how much you love them and are proud for them, and I'm going to continue to pray for them and all the ministry that God is doing. Sam, could I get you to close us in prayer today? <laughs> 